Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with strength and power coach at the GWS Giants in the AFL, Lachlan Wilmot. This episode of the Pacey Performance Podcast is sponsored by Vald Performance, the team behind the Nordboard hamstring testing system. So the Nordboard is the fastest and easiest, most accurate way to measure hamstring strength in under 90 seconds. So the Nordboard gives the right information so you can make the right decisions for your players at the right time. So it's already in use by over half the Premier League uh, and dozens of other elite teams around the world. Uh, So the Nordboard testing system is the is on its way to becoming the gold standard for measuring and monitoring hamstring strength. So if you are interested in getting to know anything more about the Nordboard, you can visit Vald Performance, that's V-A-L-D performance.com to find out more. Thanks for tuning in to episode 77 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we've got Lachlan Wilmot uh, on, the, on the show, which I've been trying to line up for a while now, so we've managed to get it done. Um, it's good. It's going to be a great episode with Lachlan, and I'm sure you'll get tons from it. Um, obviously, working with David Joyce at the GWS Giants as their strength and power coach. So we go through lots of different things uh, from his, his background, personal training, um, a little bit about the, the kind of common thoughts around personal training, uh, but why it is can be such a, an important part of a uh, coach's education. We discussed the the Nord board and how the GWS Giants use that bit of kit and how it informs their practice. Um, We also discuss the strength program um, that that Lachlan runs down at the Giants, uh, which is is really, really interesting. Um, So I'm sure you'll gain tons from it. So just before I get into the interview with Lachlan, I just want to draw your attention to the Pacey Performance webinar series number four with Dr. Sophia Nymphius which is going on on the 27th of March. So uh, if you listen to it, this this podcast, when it's just come out, it'd be live in a couple of days. So if you are interested in listening to Sophia talk about uh, agility and change direction, go over to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Sophia and all the details are on there. So I hope you enjoyed the chat with Lachlan. Again, would love your feedback um, and I will speak to you soon. So the most famous person to come on the Pace Performance Podcast in Lachlan Wilmot. So the guy behind the 500 retweets, 5,000 uh, favourites on the side of buses uh, from the GGBS Giants. So welcome to the podcast, Lachlan. Jeez, how's that intro? Thank you very much, mate. <laughs> yeah. God, you stitch, stitched me up there. Stitch you up there, but it's true. It's oh, true, yeah. mate. Jeez. Oh mate, you, you've 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 wanted me for the past half hour of talking, and then you've introduced me. <laughs> well, do you want to um, just sack the sack the intro, and do you want to give us Jeez. your in- <laughs> sack sack the intro, and give us your own intro, um, your background, and what you're currently doing? Yeah, definitely, mate. Um, so currently I'm working uh, as, a, I suppose, a strength and power coach with the GWS Giants, which is a, an AFL team uh, here in Australia, or Australian football team. Um, uh, previous to that, uh, I sort of, I've, I've sort of always been in Australian football. I, before that, I worked with our, our state academies in the New South Wales ACT area, uh, which is the state of Sydney, where Sydney's based. Um, and then prior to that, mate, I was actually a personal trainer, um, you know, doing the, the usual um, uh, everyday person and enjoying learning the trade when I was younger. But um, but uh, currently, I think uh, working under David Joyce has, has been um, sort of the past two years has been the, the big highlight of, of developing our, our athletic performance unit, as we call it, which is the department uh, here at the Giants. And, um, mate, it's been a, a fantastic adventure slowly building that because for those of you that don't know, the Giants are, are one of the youngest teams in the AFL. So we, we were established in 2012. So it, uh, it has been a, a group of very young players that we've, we've started to evolve and started to grow with. Um, 
and it's allowed our, our department and also our club to evolve at the same time. So it's been uh, an exciting adventure for the past sort of five to six years, mate. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you mentioned personal training. I mean, I don't know what it's kind of like over there, but it gets a bit of a bad rap over here. So yeah. if we got thousands and thousands of kind of undergrads coming out of sports science degrees every year, and if you actually, I'm guessing that if you said, oh, go be a personal trainer for a couple of years, it'll actually help you, they'd probably look at you as if you were crazy. Is is that yeah. something that's kind of given you a, a decent grounding to be able to take that experience into the into the Giants? Yeah, I, def look, I think um, personal training can definitely have a bad rap, um, mm -hmm. basically because of how easy it is to become a personal trainer, I think. Um, you know, whenever a job is harder to get into, by nature, it tends to have a little bit more of, uh, I suppose, respect. Maybe that's not the right word, but um, being a, you know, here you can, I think it's now eight weeks, you can do an eight week course and you can step straight into a personal training role. Uh, and look, there are some phenomenally good personal trainers, as equally there are some phenomenally bad personal trainers. But I know from my experience and I can see with people that come through our club, people that I talk to, people that I associate with, that, that those people that have had experience as a personal trainer, uh, to me, clearly stand out in their coaching ability. Uh, I think you just you don't want to make mistakes with professional athletes. The amount of mistakes I made um, when I was a personal trainer, and uh, and they're not mistakes that are that are the high risk. More things like. Uh, programming length like my first program that i wrote for a client when i was in my my first year of personal training some of them were huge and the chances of getting through them within an hour is just not going to happen because you don't take into account them talking you talking coaching things things not working or not going to plan and, and little things like that take a while to iron out and i think in a personal training setting it's a it's a fantastic place to to learn your craft of that soft skill and trying to work with clients trying to get you talking to a whole range of clients, whether they be divorcees, married, whether they're older, younger, uh, people with different experiences, different jobs, different backgrounds, and it gives you a very good ground in making those connections um, with your with your clients. And I think that carries over when you get into professional sport because when you get into professional sport, you, your clientele obviously becomes much more narrower in background in regards to, you know, for me, most of them are similar age. They're obviously all AFL players, so they have similar interests when it comes to sport. But nonetheless, they all have different backgrounds and they also have different interests outside of sport. So to to work as a personal trainer, to give you that grounding in connecting with people of ranging backgrounds, I think is priceless. And, you know, people that think they can, you know, they're 18 and they go straight into an exercise science undergrad, they'll do their undergrad for three years. And I've spoken to people and they've said, oh, I don't want to be a personal trainer. Actually, I want to be a strength conditioning coach and work with athletes. It's like, well, that's all well and good, but, but you don't understand the experience you're missing out on. Like, it, it's phenomenal. I, I don't understand why people wouldn't want to try and become a personal trainer while they're at uni. You know, get any experience they can because getting internships and, and, and getting experience in professional clubs, that's now becoming just as hard as getting a job itself. So um, so I definitely think personal training really gives someone a lot of experience, a lot of benefits. But yeah, there's definitely that, that persona that some people believe that, you know, I, I don't want to be a personal trainer. I want to be a strength coach. So, well, you know, you can do both. <laughs> yeah. And if you can speak to Mrs. Smith, who's the housewife, uh, every Monday afternoon for an hour while she's on the treadmill, or Mr. Jones, who's the solicitor, if you can speak to these guys and you, you're racking through cli uh, 10 clients every day, when if you do actually make, be one of the lucky ones, well, I say lucky ones, into getting to a professional sport, you're probably going to be able to communicate with the likes of, you know, guys in the AFL or Premier League or whoever it may be, because you can yeah. you can speak to people. You're not just a random well, who's I'll, finished I'll an undergrad. Yeah, well, mate, I was definitely throwing the deep end like that a little bit in my my first couple of weeks. One of my clients um, was a 42 year old lady, and she uh, had just found her husband cheating. on and um, she was looking to go through a divorce. And, you know, Jeez. anyone that's been a personal trainer knows that you turn into a little bit of a pop psychologist because they tend to tell you everything and talk to you. And here's a, a kid that's, you know, fresh out of high school, um, you know, 
and I've got this lady opening up to me about divorce and her husband cheating on her, and which I had absolutely no experience in. But it's one of those things that you just start to start to get much better understanding, and you, you might make mistakes, but you also learn. You know what I mean? So I think it's I think uh, any young you know, aspiring strength coach, I would, I would never tell them to say no to personal training. Mm-hmm. So, so how long have you been with the Giants now? I've been with the Giants since inception. So they were, they were created in 2011 uh, and I, was, I came on board then when, when we were uh, effectively a reserve grade team. So we played in the reserve grade competition, but we were granted um, sort of similar budgeting and similar staffing to a majority of the, the AFL clubs. And then in 2012, we, we got moved into the AFL um, as, a, as, a, as our first year in the AFL. Mm-hmm. So have you, have you? So what's that? That's six years now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So have you looked back at the programs that you did uh, when you started, just for interest? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Funnily enough, we uh, we have a, a monthly discussion group here in Sydney um, for for uh, all the strength coaches and strength conditioning coaches that uh, that can attend. And uh, I gave a presentation last year. Um, I was called Boys to Giants, so it was basically looking at um, at our long term athletic development program and, and how we brought them in as they were seventeen year olds when they came in, uh, and how we we evolved them over over the past you know five years. Years and um, and yeah, the, definitely that presentation made me look back at a few of the, the pictures, but also a few of the programs and stuff that we utilised with them in their first year there. Mm-hmm. So what what's changed since then? Was there anything that made you cringe? Uh, look, I don't think anything made me cringe. Good. But mm-hmm. one of the questions that was actually posed uh, in the presentation was if if I could go back now and change yeah. anything, what it would be. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things that I noticed, um, and I think a lot of strength coaches do it when they're younger as well, that that my use of exercises could have been cut in half. I, I think um, you know sticking to a few simpler exercises sizes and using them for longer periods of time um, would have been more beneficial than the rotation of exercises that we used. We, you know, we, we had specific blocks that we did with the boys when they were younger, but I think um, at the end of the day, we could have worked more around um, getting better buy-in from the players to do the simple exercises for a longer period of time instead of trying to rotate it to keep them entertained, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's the biggest difference now that we, with our younger boys, we really educate them around um, the use of our basic compound exercises that, that will be in their program for a good, you know, a good substantial amount of time in that initial phase. Uh, and they understand why they, they may squat or do a variation of a squat uh, for the first entire year. You know what I mean? They understand the, the principles behind that as opposed to, us, you know, prescribing a squat, but then maybe phasing it out, then phasing it back in, and and trying to keep them entertained, if that makes sense. The old entertainment that uh, that Joycey <laughs> tends to refer to. <laughs> so was that was that because you thought that they would be bored, or was that because you were, you know, you were I, trying I to you were trying to keep yourself interested as well? Well, I, I think it's definitely more around them as kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, was yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm very much of the type of trainer. I could squat every day for the rest yeah. of my life and not get yeah. bored. But um, but being footballers and being young footballers, 17 years of age, and and we were in a public gym in our first year, so we we're actually you train out of a gym where, um, you know, obviously there was everyday people running around as well. So it was uh, me being the only strength coach at the time. I was trying to manage a large group moving around um, this public gym. And I think by nature, it was just trying to keep the boys um, entertained when it comes to, you know, knowing that there's something new next week. You know, they're like, okay. And they tend to focus more when there were new things. When they were doing the same thing, you know, for four or five weeks in a row, they started to drift off and go through the motions. So it was a matter of trying to balance that, you know, um, evolution without change or progression without change. But I think we could have, we've, we put probably changed a little bit too much in the early days. Not that I think it's it's hampered them or anything, but I think from a coaching point of view, it would have been much more efficient uh, to to try and focus on building their knowledge and their understanding about why they were doing the exercise for a longer period of time rather than just trying to keep keep them entertained as, as 17-year-old kids. Mm-hmm. Cool. So you, you mentioned, the, obviously, Joycey and the, the whole team. How does your yes. stre- how does your strength program intertwine with all the, the caveats within the kind of sports science, medical, physiotherapy departments? 
Yeah, yeah. So we um, the, the strength program itself, and when we we have it rotating within the our daily schedule, we try and keep our strength hour as as our strength program. That is, you come in, you're getting strong, you're getting powerful. Um, a lot of our corrective work and our lower level stuff we actually utilize in a separate rotation um, which which we nickname robustness uh, so so it allows me to evolve the strength program specifically around your big key lifts and those big key exercises that we're working on whether it be plyometric work or or your standard barbell work and it means that all the lower level stuff that that um, that often gets put at the beginning of programs or intertwined in the programs to try and save time. Uh, the boys actually go to a separate area within our physio room and um, we have a, a movement specialist that runs um, real-time ultrasounds and Pilates work, low-level work, all your midsection slash core integration type work um, and all of those things that are, you know, when it comes to boys in the AFL, if they're a turned a hip boy or a groin boy or something like that, they'll be, they'll be grouped within groups there that they can they can work on their individual needs on a lower level and not have to have that mentality of coming into the gym starting for 10 to 15 minutes with low level stuff and then you know trying to then ramp themselves up to go for some big lifts uh, so we've we've worked that really well where I'll work quite closely with our um, our movement special which is a physiotherapist Jess she she runs our a lot of our robustness work and then all also quite tightly with Luke Heath, who's our rehab. Um, he's a physio as well, but he's our, our rehab coordinator. So he he both runs them on field in regards to their rehab, but also um, works closely with me and, and our strength rehab coach, um, Mick Byers, who, who basically controls all of their strength programs. So between the four of us, um, we sort of evolved these programs from robustness to rehab strength and into the, the high level strength work as well. So it's, it's definitely a, a team effort across the board mate <laughs> mm -hmm. so how are you grouping these guys together so you mentioned a, a grown guy hip guy what are you yeah, what's, so what's the process well look, there's um from a physio point of view our boys are, are screened daily but also they have their their major um introduction screenings and medical screenings and everything at the beginning of the season uh and so they're in Injury history, which is probably their biggest predictor. Uh, from that, our physios define whether they are at risk of a, of a groin issue, if they're at risk of, a, of any type of hip work, whether that be impingement signs, um, whether they're at risk of Achilles or they've had a history of Achilles. So from that, we start to try and form groups of players. So within within an AFL structure, there's going to be your big groups, which are you know shoulder boys. So those boys that have identified with either weaknesses or um, lacking range of motion within the shoulder or obviously have had a history of shoulder injury, whether that be subluxations or they've actually had reconstructions, uh, that's all going to red flag and that's all going to put them into the, the shoulder group. So if you're in that shoulder group, your robustness work is obviously going to focus around a little bit more low level strength, but also range of motion with your shoulder depending on what you can get to but then also within the gym it means that that'll modify lifts that i'll do with players um that have shoulder histories uh and then the same goes for hip um achilles um, we have a lot of tendon stuff as well so boys that have had a history of patella tendon pain quad tendon pain and also achilles tendon pain they all go into that that tendon group so they'll have um resilience or robustness work to do around their tendons so that that may occur in the gym with me um, when we're using heavier loads or it'll occur in their robustness rotation when they're working with with lower loads but uh but we as i said we have our big groups but there's always going to be those little ones that have you know people have had a history of rib work or whatever it might be um, we try and be as specific as we can uh, but at the end of the day um, you know they've all got to be stronger and faster so they'll all have a lot of common threads that's for sure mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So you put something on Twitter uh, a couple of days ago with regards to maintaining strength uh, in season. I just want to yes. kind of pick your brain on, firstly, the, the kind of uh, how well, basically, how you go about that and dealing with the the high loads that the and the high kind of running volume the boys go through day to day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So. So from a look, a simple uh, philosophy that we follow is that in season, you've got to sprint to stand still. So our boys week in, week out um, have huge game loads, um, mainly 
mainly from a running capacity um, and high speed meter work, but they also obviously take hits. Um, so it, it drains them quite significantly. So when it comes to us trying to get in any type of performance work during the week, it becomes much more of an art form. Um, and we really, we really look at focusing on uh, two main aspects that I think we've really worked heavily on, which, which was in my tweet, was around maximum force. So we're looking to try and expose them to some sort of maximum force, but also velocity. So we're looking to try and make sure that we expose them to velocity. So within a season, I think it's it's very easy when a player comes out of a game, so they play Saturday, they're obviously going to be sore Sunday. You get to Monday, you start to get them moving again and, and finding out if they've got any little niggles, any issues anywhere. Um, and it's very easy to get caught up in the week where you're recovering from one game and then suddenly you're preparing for the next game and you've missed the window to be able to whether it be lift heavy or run fast um, so where we put a lot of priority into utilizing our programming and our scheduling and making sure that we're working with individual players depending on who um, you know who played on a Saturday who we played on a Sunday. Uh, obviously, we we run two teams, so we have our first grade and our second grade. Uh, so they often, or sometimes, they can play on different days, which will skew our schedule a little bit. But we look at making sure that we expose our boys um, to that maximum force within a certain block. So it might be, um, we might have a three week period and we know that we have a, a Sunday to Saturday game and we know that that week is going to be a very poor window for us to try and get any maximum force into them or maximum speed. So our velocity might be quite low in our training sessions and then within the gym our intensity might be a little bit more reduced because we know we're just not going to be able to recover for the next game. But the following week we might go from a Saturday to a Sunday game which gives us an eight day break so we'll open that window up and say right we know that this is a slightly larger window and we know that because our boys didn't hit higher velocities the week before nor did they hit good force measures we need to make sure we expose them to that now because the less exposures our boys get the more they start to drop off so their strength levels will drop and their injury resilience when it comes to high velocity running drops as well because as soon as we stop exposing our boys to high speed meters and force they start to pull up sore and sore and their risk of injury starts to climb. So we really run with the philosophy, the philosophy of trying to periodize our year where we have windows where we can make sure we chase some velocity and we we can chase some force. So with the velocity side of things, Joycey and our conditioning coach, Andrew Barnett, is exceptionally well at tracking all of our players and all their high speed meters that they'll run both in the game and during the week. And then from that, They'll have their targets for each individual that they want them to be able to hit consistently. And if our boys, might be three of them, might be 10 of them, are starting to drop away for whatever reason, maybe they played a slightly different role in the game and weren't exposed to enough high speed meters. Maybe they put up with a, a cork to the quad and they maybe didn't get the same running velocities they needed to get in one of the training sessions. That will be marked down and we will make sure that we expose them, if it's appropriate, within windows to make sure that half the season hasn't gone and suddenly there's a handful of players that have been exposed to high speed running and suddenly they go into a game and they get slightly moved or they may have to what we call tag which is basically they follow a key play from another team around the whole game just trying to disrupt his game and that can expose a player to a lot of high speed meters so we really ensure against these these spikes um, that might occur when they might change roles or change positions so it's um it's a it's a bit of a mixture of art and science um, i think that's what i wrote in the tweet it's it's very easy to say that you've got to expose boys to force and you've got to expose boys to velocity, but I think uh, what I love about it is sitting down and, and using the art of coaching to try and figure out when are we going to expose them and, and, and how are we going to do it to make sure that, that both our young boys, but in particular our older boys, don't lose their maximum strength and don't lose their ability to produce velocity because some of our older boys are the ones that, um, that are the hardest because you know they, they become quite fragile as they get older. They're, uh, you know, when you're over 30 years of age, you've accumulate a lot of injury history and you'll get a lot of these little niggle things and the easiest thing to do is just to pull them off the track or to stop them from doing something because it's an easy solution but I think the art and the trick that we've really started to, to push forward with is finding things where we can expose them 
to whether it be force or velocity that are going to make them much more injury resilient when they go back out on track um, for the next game or the next two games. And um, and I think that's it's been a big focus of us um, last year and again this year and and. Playing with the Nord board last year was really good for us as well to try and keep that because for us that's a maximum force exposure to the hamstrings and so uh, to be able to track that a little bit closer and, and get the boys to buy into that with numbers because they love seeing whether they're on top or they're second in the club so that's been a really good uh, asset for us as well to to put a little bit more objectivity to the uh, the maximum force exposure that our boys get in their hamstrings. So how often are you using the Nord board? Uh, the Nord boards would be utilised with our, within our pre-season about three times um, for a majority of the boys. And then in season, we look to try and get it done um, within our bye week. Um, but what we are starting to do is utilise it within our actual gym session. So the boys really like the, the new software we're where it actually tells you left v right, so they can see a live feed of uh, of as they're lowering down, whether it, whatever exercise they might be doing on it, they can see how much force their left is producing versus how much force their right is producing. Uh, so we actually put the computer in front of them um, and allow them to to use the Nord board for their exercises. So um, it, it may not be the most accurate measure. It's a little bit of dirty science because it's obviously done at different times within their. Pro programs at different times of day and everything like that but uh, but it's a, a fantastic feedback tool for our boys um, and it's too much they're, they're the ones that are in, wanting it set up all the time so um, so it's good to see that they're they're chasing the numbers more than anything mm -hmm. so when you you mentioned a couple of minutes ago about top-ups for the players that maybe haven't played as many minutes or have picked up an injury or something like that how are you yes. how are you making sure that 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 top-up is kind of hitting the numbers that you want and the reason i ask is that when i played probably eight years ago it was everyone would go in after the game and you'd see all the idiots like myself who weren't involved in the game doing box-to-box -box runs and the, yep. the, the physio at the time would probably pick a random number how many are we doing uh eight and then you do eight and then you go in no one kind of knew what intensity you'd done um, how fast you'd run, you know, it was just a, a yes. out of the yes. air. So how do you guys make sure that's kind of hitting the numbers that you want to hit? Look, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, probably a combination of two, not, not necessarily yeah. picking numbers out of the air, but yeah. sometimes we will do it a game day, but a majority of the time we'll find it during the week. So within a game, we're allowed to wear GPS. Um, so all of our boys are, are GPS within their games. So we have live numbers uh, that come back to to um, James McBrien, who's our GPS man. He uh, he picks up all the numbers um, and tracks them and, and can report straight back to Joycey and, and Andrew, our conditioning coach, about where they're at. So what tends to happen is we'll um, – Last year, we had a, 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 a position called a substitute, which basically usually didn't play for the first half of the game and then was activated at the end of the game um, or during the game for an injury. So the, that person was getting topped up at the end of the game uh, because obviously they're only playing half a game. Now, are we able to top up half a game's worth? Obviously not. So we would actually look at the GPS data and Andrew and Joyce would decide, right, this is where he's done in regards to high-speed meters and distances. Let's try and find 30% of that or 20% of that now while he's warm at the ground. So they'll then prescribe what he might be running, whether it be distances and speeds they'll be doing it at to make sure that he's hitting the, the intensity they want. Um, so they'll top up you know, 20 to 30% then. And then remainder will be found during the week. So at the Monday session when boys might be doing a little bit more of a recovery run um, by a session, the the boy that uh, that may have missed you know a quarter of the game, half of the game, he'll then do a couple of extra high speed work then, and he'll find another another thirty uh, percent. And obviously in the main training, he might find another you know, thirty or forty percent there. So it, it's definitely not something that um, or you didn't play very long, therefore we're just going to run you, and you're going to run the same as everyone else. It is very very much about radio. 
how far off the main group are you? And we will find that over the next six to seven days, whatever might be the best option for you. But what tends to happen more, and especially this year, because the, the substitute is actually being abolished, so there will be no substitutes. So all players, unless they're injured, will be rotating to play a, a full game. Uh, more likely than missing out on distances, they'll tend to miss out on high-speed meters, whether they're, it just might be the style of the game. And most likely it'll be, you know, if it's in our forward line a lot or if it's in their forward line a lot, the opposing uh, position may not get as much of the ball, therefore may not run as much, um, so on and so forth. So what will happen then is once the analysis has been done with our GPS work that night and the following day, Joycey and Barney will then decide, right, what do we want to get out of what? But players, yep, there's four players that have clearly missed some velocity bands. They're, they're definitely down on the rest of the group. We feel they're at risk. Therefore, over the coming days, we'll find the appropriate time to top them up with some speed stuff. Usually that'll be done in a main training session and it may be done you know, at the beginning, during the middle, at the end, whatever fits in with the, the program at the time. It, it definitely is an art because it fluctuates so much each week. But the general goal is compare the team, those outliers that are clearly below where they should be for their positional group. We need to find some time during the week to try and top them up while they're on field, not create an entirely new session where they have to warm up prep and then go out and do it it'll it'll just be tacked on to one of the current sessions mm -hmm. so are you allowed to collect data and use that data live within the game or is it all retrospective spot on yeah every every no nah, no nah, live data so the, okay. um, all so the 18 players on a field at any one time so both teams will have all players on gps uh and and all the data will be going live back to our our computer that um you know sometimes we use the live data more than other times but um but it's definitely always there to be used it's it is an agreement that the afl have that all clubs can do it but we then uh, um blinded we we give them our data so the afl do a, a annual gps data report um on all all of the teams so they'll look at you know your, your top four teams versus your bottom four teams and, and compare different um, GPS statistics, uh, all blinded, but you can probably work out sometimes which teams is which, but, um, but they, they, um, they do a pretty good job of that. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I just want to um, touch on, again, something that you've probably mentioned already, which was regards to the rehab and yes. uh, your use of, of jumps and plyos. Um, well, firstly, in the guys that uh, are fit and, and playing, compared to the how you use it in kind of end stage rehab yeah definitely so um as a strength coach uh i'm i'm pretty big proponent of plyometric and jump work um i definitely believe there's a big difference between jumps and plyometrics uh, i'm a bit old school in the view that plyometrics are exceptionally explosive um i think a lot of people um that call things plyometrics they're actually just jumps um, so we definitely try and add in a combination of, of high-end plyometric work, but also your, your standard jump landing mechanic work. Um, and in particular, we have a really good focus and one of the best focus that I've seen around um, in the return to play structure. Uh, so Luke Heath, our, our um, head of rehab, he's, he's been really strong in uh, exit criteria for our boys. Um, in fact, if you ask the boys, probably a bit of a Nazi with it, but um, but he has very strong, very objective measures that he wants to see for his players when they're returning, um, whether that be ACL in worst case scenario or things like a, a simple, you know, a grade one, grade two ankle sprain, whatever it might be. Um, and amongst some force measures and some symmetry measures, uh, he also uses um, a couple of, you know, hop for distance and a little bit of plyo um, measures that allows the boys to be a little bit more of that explosive side and we also have a big selling point on you might be pain free you might be strong enough and you might be able to train but are you ready to perform so a big philosophy with our return to play is not just you know that is it's not just return to play it's also return to performance so so we set some pretty strong targets from a strength point of view from an explosive point of view and then also from the, the physio realm which would be along you know low level strength measures symmetry and then range of motion work and these boys are, are presented all of this at the beginning of their rehab so they know exactly where they're going with it um, and we have quite a quite a big focus at the end stage when Mick Byers our, our strength rehab coach takes 
a lot more control of them, which is usually when they're starting to be introduced back into training. Um, he'll have them in the gym and be working really closely with them along A, big strength movements, but B, a lot of their jumping mechanics, landing mechanics and plyo work. So um, we, we have definitely been big proponents of trying to make sure that uh, the plyometric work included into their return to play because I think a lot of time it's missed out on um, and it's it's not necessarily missed out on because people forget about it but I think it's once a player gets back into training and especially when they start to become available for games uh, this hyper focus of their development whether it be let's, let's say an ACL you know if someone's suddenly available to play after they've had an ACL injury, they they tend to drop a lot of the things that they probably should be doing that are going to increase their performance, but also decrease their risk of a, of another ACL. And often that's going to be your explosive stuff because you obviously are going to be quite fatigued after playing games and, and jumping around is probably the last thing you want to do. So I think um, us starting some low level landing mechanics quite early in, in our rehabilitation program um, has been really beneficial because it means that as they get into the end of it, they're really doing some quite high-end plyo work um, that are going to set them up for some really good rate of force development actions on the field, but also their ability to change direction, their ability to be able to decelerate and accelerate. I think it all contributes quite nicely um, to mix it all in to make sure that they're as confident as they can be when they return. So um, uh, like we, like I've talked about before on Twitter, I think just, just being able to have that plyometric component and making it a major part of their end stage rehab, I think is is very important. So are you, for your, for your general kind of strength and power movements, are you looking for a certain percentage of their pre-injury uh, pre injury numbers? Yeah, definitely are. Often, uh, often they're not injured limbs, we're looking for PBs, so, mm -hmm. uh, or PRs if you're from America. <laughs> but um, we're, we're definitely definitely target based off what their history is. Um, we look at, you know, if they're, let's, let's keep running with an ACL example. Um, if they have done an ACL, we'll make sure that we're chasing upper body strength. Now, with some of our players, putting on mass can actually be a little bit detrimental because being such a, a high running sport, if you're weighing 82 kilos and you get an ACL injury and you come back at 86 kilos because you've just been doing bench press for most of your off season or most of your time away, um, it's going to make it really hard for you to return to play. Um, so we're, we're very diligent in making sure that our boys' body weights don't spike and we don't suddenly have this unwanted mass on them, whether it be pure muscle or not, it doesn't matter. Um, so we, we're very conscious of that, but we are very, very proactive in pushing their strength, um, even if they're injured. So that's one of our big focuses. Uh, and now, as I said, they'll have those targets set for them pretty much um, at the, the onset of their, their rehabilitation program. Now, edits will come things will you know targets might be beaten and then we'll we'll ramp them up a little bit or, or we might have a setback with something um, and obviously things will update but yeah we, we definitely use their history um, a bit of a percentage um, of what they've lifted before um, but we we are very yeah, very objective in what we give them to make sure that they have very clear targets of what they what they're chasing mm -hmm. so is, is keeping is keeping weight ever an issue especially in the off season where like you say Guys are benching every day. Yeah, we, we look. We've got um, off season is definitely you know an easier place to bench because you know if I, if I go on an off season, I'll always find a mate that wants to come to the gym with me to bench press, but I won't find a mate that'll come squat with me. <laughs> um, so it's. It's, it's sort of a, a pendulum swings either way when it comes to AFL players. So the, the best analogy I can give is a, if, you, if you take a team of AFL players, you'll have some that'll swing closer to soccer players and you'll have some that'll swing closer to rugby players. And what I mean by that is you'll have some boys that love weight training, will change base loads will love really lifting heavy and, and pushing themselves and you know they'll get doms but they know why they get doms they don't care it's great it means that they've worked hard and then you've got your other people that are very much about oh got to be fresh for the game got to prep for the game got to prep for training got to be really good to go and a, a little bit more nervous about it so we definitely have those two groups where you know some need to be um, encourage more and also have more buy-in, but that's just the same as any team. You know, each athlete's a little bit different. But what we tend to find is those those running style athletes, um, which are almost like little whippets. They're quite thin and lean, and they'll run they'll run all game. And running's their strong suit. When it comes to weight training, they find it very hard to maintain mass, which is fairly logical. Like 
we we work with them pre-season, we work with them in-season to maintain mass and when they go on their off-season, if they get lucky, Easy and they don't lift as much as they should or when they should and stuff like that or they focus on you know just bench press where the, the actual utilization of, of all their muscle groups is not being done then we'll find that they'll actually lose a couple of kilos because they're naturally leaner and naturally lighter so for them we really need to make sure that our dietitian works with them around what they're going to be eating in the off season but also making sure they just get exposed that we just keep that exposure to, to strength work within their off-season program. But then, yeah, we've definitely got the other group of boys that, um, you know, they're, they're naturally more bulkier and they naturally will put on muscle. Uh, but we know that as they start to bulk up more, they, they find their running ability starts to drop a little bit. And it might not be their speed per se, but just their ability to move themselves around a, a cricket oval for two hours um, becomes much harder. So in the off-season, you know, they, if they just settle down and do their – their go-to bench press, bench pull, and stuff like that. Instead of focusing on specific targets that we've set, we'll notice that they come back a little bit heavier than they should. Uh, but, but realistically, most of our boys are pretty good with what they do. They stick to what they're meant to when they're meant to. Um, it's there's no hiding the fact that they definitely um, skip a few things here and there. But I think that's just the nature of any 18 to you know 30 year old. <laughs> Absolutely. No, cool. So I'm just, again, slightly conscious of time, but do you want to um, just just let us know where people can find you on Twitter, Facebook, wherever it may be? I know you're quite active on Twitter anyway. Yeah, definitely. All the, probably the easiest is Twitter, which is um, Lachlan underscore Wilmot. Um, and, uh, yeah, mate, look, also my email, which is Lachlan dot wilmot at gwsgiants.com.au more than happy for for anyone to shoot me an email with any questions but um but twitter's just as easy mate i tend to respond pretty quickly and pretty well on there um but happy to hear from anyone cool well like i say i'll um i'll round up i'm just yeah i don't want to keep you all all evening so just want to thank you for your time um and how open you've been with with the stuff you're doing um down in sydney so we'll keep in touch mate no. Fantastic, Rob. Really appreciate your time, mate. Appreciate uh, letting me on. <laughs> Pleasure. Speak to you soon, mate. Okay, mate. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to episode 77 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Lachlan. Just before I let you go, I just want to say a massive thanks to Val Performance, the, the team behind the Nord Board, for sponsoring this episode today. So, just and another thing is the Pacey Performance webinar series number four with Dr. Sophia Nymphius, which is happening on Sunday the 27th of March at 10 a.m. GMT. Um, so if, if you are interested in getting on board with the webinar, the first three have been great uh, and I'm sure this, uh, this will be no different. So if you are interested in getting involved in the webinar, you can go to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Sophia. So hope to see you there and I will speak to you in episode 78.